Psalm 34 verse 7 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Today, I want to speak about our desires. We all have desires, certain desires. Some of our desires are good. Others are questionable. Some desires may be good, but become dominating. And if we lack some desires that we should, perhaps a desire, for instance, for food, we probably have a problem. But some people's desires are so out of proportion that they cannot think straight, like Esau. The book of Hebrews that was read to us in the second reading addresses the danger of falling away from Christ. This book is full of warnings about this. It is pastoral and practical. It describes Christ the perfection of Christ, the perfection, the superiority of Christ as the antidote to falling into something less than perfect. So the question that presents itself to us is this, am I in danger of missing God's grace without realising it? Let's go to the next slide. The example in our reading today, the negative example is Abraham's grandson, Esau. Hebrews 12, verse 25, so on, says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought it with tears. Hebrews 12 talks about a bitter root. And to introduce the story of Esau's fall, the writer speaks about the need for holiness. He says, without holiness, no one will see the law. And this is a positive statement. You need holiness. But then he moves to the negative and says, see to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. He cites, you see, Deuteronomy chapter 29, make sure there is no man or woman whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. This was spoken as part of the renewal of the covenant under Moses before Israel's entry into the land of promise. The bitter root deceives the heart. For the next verse warns against hearing the words of the covenant and agreeing with them, but saying in the heart, I will be safe, even though I persist in going my own way, mouthing the words but having a heart which is self-deceiving. So the root of bitterness for Israel was forsaking the Sinai covenant that she had received from God. For us today, it is forsaking the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. A bitter spirit is incompatible with Christ. Don't we see a lot of bitterness today? We see it in the victim movement. Everyone's a victim. Everyone's bitter and everyone can blame somebody else for their own misfortunes. It doesn't matter what it is. That's what it seems to be, doesn't it? There is so much resentment and envy and blame shifting today. I saw a funny clip this last week of a, it was purely humorous, but an Englishman, he had a, a bucket with a British flag around it, and he was in the capital of Norway asking for reparations for generational hurt for him for the Viking invasions. (laughs) Of course, some people actually gave him their credit card numbers. You know, like, where do you end? Everything bad that happens always seems to be somebody else's fault today, especially the government's. 
Israel here is warned that she would become bitter if she went after the gods of the nations. Today, it's a bit like money, isn't it? And so will we. Bitterness is the fruit when we miss the grace of God. It defiles and causes trouble. Have you ever lived or worked with a bitter and resentful person? It's not pretty, is it? Bitterness steals God's grace from us. Yet the primary story here is Esau, the older twin of Jacob. Two stories about Esau are mentioned. First, in verse 16, Esau selling his birthright for a simple meal, which is Genesis 25. And the second in verse 17 is Esau being cheated out of his father's blessing by his younger brother. That's in Genesis chapter 27. So let's look at Esau sells his birthright, Genesis chapter 25. Now, we all know probably that Esau and Jacob were twins, that Esau was delivered first, so the elder, and therefore his inheritance would probably be twice that of Jacob's. Esau was a wild country hunter and Jacob was the homeboy. He probably liked cooking. One day, one day Esau came in starving, came home starving and demanded some of the lentil stew Jacob was cooking, not lamb or goat, but lentils. Jacob, schemer that he was, for Jacob means literally grasping the heel, that means deceiver, he was happy to comply. As long as his older twin brother paid for it with his inheritance, his birthright, his right to receive the best and the blessing from his father, and Esau, the fool, agreed. He sold his inheritance as the firstborn for red lentil stew. Why did he do that? The presenting reason is straightforward. He was famished. He was hungry. The desire for food overran his common sense. Desire. He was driven by his appetites, what we might call his appetitive desires. He could not or would not say no to his desires, to his appetites. The immediacy of his appetite totally dominated any thoughts of the future. He was, in modern language, incapable of delayed gratification. He was impetuous and incapable of the slightest self-regulation or self-discipline. He was desire-driven. And selling his birthright takes on the terrible form of losing his father's blessing a few chapters later. So let's think about desire. What is desire and how does it work? There are many types of desires, aren't there? We usually think of bodily, endocrinological desires like sex and food. But there are many other desires as well, like the desire for friendship, the desire for le uh, rest and leisure, the desire for personal acceptance and value, the intellectual growth and stimulation. There is certainly the desire for some people for exercise. There's definitely the desire late at night for sleep. There's a desire for aesthetic delights like music and the visual arts. But one thing about desire is that it is cyclic in nature. We have a desire, that desire is met and satisfied and then goes away, but only for a short time. For that desire again emerges. It again seeks fulfilment. It again is fulfilled and is satisfied and then declines. And again it emerges and so on and so on. And once desire is satisfied, it can become nauseating to continue to fulfil it. Um, any of you enjoy chocolate? Would you like one piece? It's empty. Two pieces? The whole block? Two blocks in one sitting? Three? It will make you sick. You'll have a desire for it. But if you keep going, it will become nauseating, won't it? It becomes nauseating. So you see, desire, when it's given its head, becomes nauseating. When properly regulated, 
desire is God's way of ensuring that we live well, that we keep sleeping, that we keep eating, that we keep drinking and befriending and learning and exercising and so on, but within proper limits so it doesn't just continue and make us ill. Desire has that certain rhythm about it, doesn't it? The desire comes. We satisfy the desire. The desire declines and so on and so on and so on. So desires need regulation. Esau could not regulate his desire. He allowed his desire to expand beyond its proper place, didn't he? Sure, he was famished, and that's not good. But couldn't he wait a few minutes or an hour? Wasn't there any food in the tent? Perhaps he was cold and hungry, and the desire was stimulated by the aroma and the smell of the stew, and it set him up. All that is mere speculation but it was his bodily appetite and desires that he simply could not manage. That might not be food for us. It might be for some. It might be sleep or the couch or those in our age or my age, the desire for retired leisure. It could be for sport, TV. It could be a bad thing a desire for a bad thing. Or like Esau, it could be a desire for a good thing that has gotten out of hand and grown out of all proportion. Whatever it is, a desire that is not properly regulated can rob us of our birthright as Christians, just as Esau allowed his appetite, his good appetite for food, to rob him of his inheritance. There is a right place for the desire for food. You may be hungry now. And so might I, but it would be inappropriate for you to open a Big Mac and start chewing at church. It's the inappropriate place for it. It is also the inappropriate place for going to sleep as well. <laughs> Esau, we read in Genesis chapter 25, despised his birthright. It does not say that Jacob exploited his brother's birthright, even though he probably did. Esau is wholly culpable for his own failure. Back in Hebrews 12, Esau is described as godless and immoral. We may replace the word godless today with secular, without God, in the modern anti-God sense. Esau, I think, in some ways is a type of modern Western secular person who lives on the basis of bodily desires but treats his spiritual inheritance in the gospel with disdain. He lives wholly for this life and never for the next, not for the life to come, the resurrection of the body. He lives for his share portfolio or he lives for his superannuation if he's working. When he is old, he passively allows himself to be exploited by the tourism industry for living for his bucket list, but fails to see that after the bucket stands the courtroom, the divine judgment, he is godless, and he is secular. We must not be like him. But then we come to Esau's tears He's in Genesis chapter 27. And this is the second story that we read about Esau. This is the outworking of him selling his birthright. His old father Isaac wants to bless him, but first he asks Esau to go out and make him his favourite goat stew dinner. But Isaac's wife... And Esau's mother, Rebecca, who loves Jacob more, overhears and gets Jacob to impersonate his older brother and get his father's blessing. And the ruse works. Jacob deceives his father, Isaac, on the prompting of his mother and receives the blessing from his father. Esau then comes in and Isaac realises to his utter horror that his younger son has deceived him. Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing, he says to Esau. And Esau is absolutely beside himself with rage. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. He's outraged by it. In loud weeping, Esau implores his father Isaac for a blessing. But Isaac has no blessing, but only these words. 
Your dwelling will be away from earth's riches, richness, away from the dew of heaven. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow, grow restless, you will throw off his yoke from your neck. And the rest of the Old Testament, in many places, that story testifies to the ongoing conflict between the descendants of these twins, Jacob, who becomes Israel, and Esau, who becomes Edom. But the focus in Hebrews is on Esau's inability to repent. He could not bring about a change of mind. The Greek word is metanoia, repentance. He could not repent, he could not bring around a change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. And this is the burden of the book of Hebrews, the danger of drifting so far for so long from the grace of God in the gospel that repentance becomes an impossibility. Friends, this is not some theological speculation about salvation. It's simply a very practical story and an example of what not to do. Don't do an Esau. No Esau's. How does it work? Let's imagine that we invite a person to repent of their sins. That's the word used about Esau. Repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And they may reply, well, I don't want to. And so we reply, well, then change your mind and want to. But the reply comes back, but I don't want to. So we say, then want to, want to. But it's no use. As it goes on and on, like Esau, they may shed tears over a failed life or a big loss, but repentance is something they cannot and will not do. The blessing escapes them, for repentance from sin escapes them. Tears may flow for a great loss, but not the tears of repentance before God. Wrong desire wrong feeling, wrong sorrow dominates. As Paul eloquently states it in 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow with tears, presumably, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. There can be worldly sorrow. There can be worldly tears without repentance. Esau's two failures are related. First, he could not regulate his desire, and then he could not repent. An unregulated desire is like that. It is spiritually deadly. Appetites and desires we surely have. They are God-given, but they should not rule us so that we sacrifice our spiritual inheritance on their altar. The body is real and its appetites, but so is the soul. When Jesus said that we do not live by bread alone, he was not criticising eating bread. He was teaching us that allowing the appetite for bread to extinguish our spiritual inheritance from the word of God is wrong. Jesus certainly fed the crowd with a few loaves of bread, but then rebuked them the following day when we read it on the screen. He says, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the bread and had your fill. But he gave them the bread and that was okay. But why are they now looking for him? He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And tragically, at the end of the story in John 6, we read that many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. We need bread. We also need the word of God. But the secularist, the secular person, the godless like Esau, thinks only of bread and the bread is more important than God and sells his soul to get it. Hebrews is a simple and clear pastoral exhortation to respond to God in faith and repentance when he speaks and to never harden our hearts, which includes allowing desire to dominate us. So I want us to think about desire for a moment. Let's have a look up here that desire. Desires can be bad, can't they? 
the unfaithful are trapped by evil desire. Desire can be good. God satisfies my desire with good things. So what do we make of our desires? In the New Testament, the key word for desire, which is epithumia, is generally negative. It means ungodly or unholy desires, and is often translated as lust, but not only. But there can be good desires. And surely the greatest object of our desire is to be God himself. So Psalm 84, verse 2, my soul yearns. Here's desire, isn't it? My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the law. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God, yearning, crying out for God, fainting out of a weakness by wanting to attend corporate worship in the temple of God. Here is a deep inner passion and desire for God and for his worship. Esau's desire diminished him and destroyed him. The psalmist's desire enlarges him and ennobles him. Nothing, nothing that comes from God to us is bad for us. Everything that comes from God to us is good for us. Desire may transgress, however, its proper limits and become sinful, disorder our lives and so, so destroy. So Eve, for instance, saw the fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate. But some desire also may remain within its proper limits and be godly, order our lives and so ennoble us. Proverbs 11, the desires of the righteous ends only in good. Righteous desire is good for us. Desire is built into the very fabric of our humanity and it is only truly satisfied in God. God created us so that we are fulfilled ultimately and finally only in him and in love of him and in obedience of him. And hence those most wondrous ancient words, although not as old as the word of God, written in 1648, the introduction of the Westminster Catechism, question one, what is the chief end of man? Or what is the chief purpose of human life? Answer, man's chief end, your chief purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To enjoy God, that's desire. To glorify him and to enjoy him forever. And the confession cites Psalm 16. Surely I have a delightful, a delightful inheritance. And it says, you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Got that? At the right hand of God in heaven, with God there are eternal pleasures and fulfilled joy. The psalmist has eternal pleasures. Esau had lentil stew. Which one would we choose? You see, the focus upon disordered bodily desires, as with Esau, may lead us to believe wrongly that God can't be the object of our desire. But the psalmist says there is. We could be tempted to think that there's no such thing as morally good spiritual desire, that there's no such thing as morally good spiritual desire. The result is that we mistakenly seek to fulfil our most fundamental human desire outside of God, and that's where the mistake comes. Yet we read, read in the Scripture, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in God fulfills our desires. God, you see, is the proper object of our deepest desire. God is so wonderful, isn't he? And our hearts so made for him that we can never get sick of him. 
We never can have too much of God on earth, and we never will have too much of him, him in heaven like we would have too much food and feel sick. Desire for God will be fully satisfied, but not in the sense that any more of him will make us feel ill. The cyclic character of earthly desire shows us that it simply cannot be fully satisfying finally. Its fulfilment is always temporal and so must be replenished over and over again. You may eat more than your fill at lunch today, even to the point of sickness, although I'd encourage you not to, but you'll still need to eat the rest of the week. Eating will never finally satisfy, but God does. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So I'm suggesting that God is to be the object of our deepest desires. Desire itself is not wrong. It keeps us alive. We may even be hungry now. But because our origin is in God, we begin in God. God is the origin of our life. And because he is our goal and end and purpose in life, that we start in God, we end in God. We started from God, we end with God. God is to be the great object of our desire. So we should desire God. We should yearn for God. As the psalm says, Jesus said that we are blessed if we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And righteousness is from God and God himself is righteous. It is really tragic, isn't it? It is truly tragic when people made for God find their fulfilment outside of him. When people say they are completely fulfilled in their work or in their house or in their retirement or in their family, that is an impoverished view of the human life. Those things are there. They are not to be despised, but they cannot ultimately fulfill our souls because our souls are made for something so much greater and grander, which is God. We can't be fully fulfilled outside of him. So Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, I think he'd almost swap the words around and you could almost say, desire God and he will give you the delights of your heart. This does not mean, of course, that God will give you ungodly desires, that if you seek God hard enough, he'll give you a BMW. Doesn't mean that. That's not the point. It means that when we delight in God, when we delight in God, he will truly become our great desire as he should be. It does not mean suppressing other godly desires, but it does mean regulating them, unlike Esau, so they serve the greater desire of knowing and loving and seeking and serving God, who is to be our chief and greatest desire. So a resounding no, Esau, but also an even louder yes, God is the great object of our desire. So let's set out part our heart for him and let's delight in God. And I'm going to just pray and I'm going to use an old prayer I found in a book and it will have some old-fashioned language perhaps and ideas, but it captures the idea. The prayer is called Man's Great End or the great purpose or goal of human life. Let's pray together. <laughs> Lord of all being, there is one thing that deserves our greatest care that calls forth our ardent desires. That is that we may answer the great end or purpose for which we are made to glorify you who has given us being and to do all the good we can for our fellow friends. 
Truly, life is not worth having if it be not improved for this noble purpose. Yet, Lord, how little is this the thought of people. Most seem to live for themselves without much or any regard for your glory or for the good of others. They earnestly desire and eagerly pursue the riches, honours, pleasures of this life as if they suppose that wealth, greatness, merriment could make their immortal souls happy. But alas, what false delusive dreams are these? Give us grace always to keep in covenant with you and to reject as delusion a great name here or hereafter, together with all sinful pleasures or profits. Help us to know continually that there can be no true happiness, no fulfilling of your purpose for me, apart from a life lived in and for the son of your love our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.